I'd like to introduce Dr. Alexander Sitch. He's an associate professor of physics at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. He holds a BS in nuclear engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute with a minor in physics, an MA in Soviet studies from Harvard University, an MA in philosophy from Holy Apostles College and Seminary, and PhD in nuclear engineering from MIT. Professor Sitch conducted his PhD research in Ukraine at the Chernobyl site and worked in the former Soviet Union in nuclear safety and non-proliferation efforts regarding weapons of mass destruction for over 13 years. In addition to technical articles, Professor Sitch has published opinion pieces on nuclear safety, including the Iranian Rusher issue in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the Boston Globe, the Wall Street Journal, the Diplomat, and Newsday. Professor Sitch is married with seven children, speaks near native fluent Ukrainian and fluent Russian. His current research interests lie primarily in the philosophy of nature and in teaching. Welcome, Dr. Sitch. Thank you very much, and especially I want to thank the organizers of this conference. Um, after the superb talk that Professor uh, Bradley just gave us, um, I would say blessed us with. Um, I almost want to suggest even now, just as we're getting off the ground with this conference, that maybe we should uh, consider expanding it uh, and making it a regular conference, even possibly to the point of maybe preceding it with a working group sessions where we would come to some conclusions to present at a conference. I think that might be a very useful thing to do. Um, so, but. All right, now, there, I, have to, I have to admit that uh, this is, uh, I have four reasons why it's difficult for me to follow Professor Bradley. First and foremost, uh, because of his eminence and, and career and uh, experience in his career. Um, the second uh, is because there's a number of issues with which I disagree with him, but I disagree with him in the sense of not critiquing to critique but to critique in order to that the both of us can now come to some good dialectic and improve and transcend where perhaps the both of us are. Um, the third reason why it's going to be a little bit difficult to do this is, although I'm an engineer, I'll be wearing primary, primarily my philosopher's hat today. Um, and so there's going to be some terms that I'm going to be using. I'm going to try to keep them um, at bay, but necessarily I have to address them and primarily what I'm going to try to do is to distinguish, because a good philosopher distinguishes. Uh, and in particular, there's terms like creation, like cause, like change, like uh, many others, that if not properly distinguished, and I'm sure all of you understand that if you read some of it, um, and, if, uh, and I apologize for using this word, but in a sense I really mean it, I'm sure you guys at a certain level, you even understand it when you read some of the pinheaded stuff that's written by, uh, by Hawking, by Dawkins. Uh, they are straying way off their own reservations, and they are doing pseudo-philosophy. Okay. Um, and the final thing is that I'm going to say this at the beginning, and then I'm going to repeat it at the end, but I'm going to descend into a valley, which may seem strange to you. Okay. I think, literally, one has to be out of their mind, out of their mind, to deny design in nature. Okay. I say that for many reasons, but for one reason in particular, is that to deny the ability to see design in nature is to deny one's rationality. I mean, it really is. We as rational agents reason to higher immaterial verities based on what we collect, so to speak, from our sensory knowledge. Now, another fancier way of saying sensory-based sensory knowledge is science. We have to know how the real world works well, cold, in order to then use that knowledge to reason to higher immaterial verities. That's what, and I'll be talking about uh, 1 Romans 1, 19 and 20, which, which Professor Bradley also uh, uh, shared with us. But, and this is where the but gets kind of, uh, maybe a little provocative. I want to apologize 
if this comes across as a lecture. I don't mean it to come across as a lecture. I really don't. Um, please be assured that that's not my intention, but please be also equally assured that it's important to draw these distinctions that I'm going to, that I'm going to be drawing for you. Okay. Now, um, we need to talk about terms, and one of the biggest, most important terms is metaphysics. What metaphysics is not? Now, if, if any of you are familiar with, with the current state of philosophy, generally in the world, in, in the United States in particular, most predominant schools of philosophy are at best indifferent to, or more likely positively skeptical, if not openly hostile to metaphysics. <coughs> I've been involved in enough discussions, philosophical and scientific, where I can say that hands down. Um, so today, metaphysics is not seen in the classical, as, a, as the classical systematic study of being is being, and I'll, and I'll expand on that a little bit later, and the properties that apply to all beings. But it's usually put forward as a grab bag of diverse problems, free will, existence of God, mind, body, and so on. And they're usually relegated in a direction where, for now, you always get this rain check, uh, the natural sciences, phenomenology, and other specialized physical techniques can't deal with them. <coughs> now, in other words, metaphysics is often kind of a crude synonym for worldview or philosophy. And I want to, and this is where I apologize, again, I'm not critiquing to critique, I'm critiquing because some very important <coughs> distinctions have to be drawn here. Consider the description provided by this conference. Metaphysics is about the ultimate nature of reality. Well, in a qualified sense, that's true. Okay. It includes many aspects of reality that are generally skipped over in, the sta in standard physics, such as choice, creativity, morality, and aesthetics. That's actually incorrect. Okay. And I apologize for saying that, but it has to be said. Choice, morality, creativity, and aesthetics have no place in physics. Okay. Physics studies certain things. These things are not what physics study. Okay? And that distinction is one of the most important uh, to realize when you're distinguishing what each of the sciences uses as its subject matter or sometimes called proper object. Okay, and again, I'll get into those. Science is often bound by a methodological disregard for anything other than efficient causes. Well, that's also not completely true. The material cause of the four Aristotelian causes is an extremely uh, important component of the modern empirical sciences or the natural sciences, but it's a component that's eviscerated of its broader sense. Okay? Same thing for the formal cause. The formal cause does not have any, I'm repeating myself, formal place in the modern empirical sciences, but it does manifest itself in another kind of <coughs> eviscerated sense. Mathematics is a distant reflection of the formal cause, the whatness of things. And then the final one is that as engineers, our job is to include the whole of reality and to provide solutions that incorporate our entire knowledge. I hope not. Okay. Engineers cannot be assigned that task. They should not be assigned that task. And I'll give you, without ex further explanation, one example. If you substituted the word scientist in here, as scientists, our job is to include the whole of reality. What does that remind you of? That's called scientism. We do not want to fall into <coughs> the trap of, if I can present a neologism here, we don't want to fall into the, to the trap of engineering isn't. I can't even pronounce it. Okay. All right, so there's some important questions that are begged. Right. First, the, the first several ones are, what is science? What is engineering? What is metaphysics? But perhaps even more importantly, standing above those, is to what extent do each of these span the entire realm of human knowledge? These are vitally important questions. Okay. <coughs> there is a crucial distinction based on the role of truth in all human activities. The distinction <coughs> of seeing man as either a knower, a doer or actor, and maker or builder. In all three of these cases, man is a thinker because he's by his nature a rational uh, animal by his very nature. But the kind of thinking that occurs in each one of these three realms is different, and the results themselves are quite different. The kind of thinking that man does as a knower, simply for the sake of knowing, what do I mean simply for the sake of knowing? 
If I want to know what a neutron star is or what it does out there, I seek that knowledge because it's valuable knowledge in and of itself. And, you, and then you can span the, the, all of reality and you can see how important it is just to know reality, which is what I was kind of alluding to at the beginning. You have to know reality really well. You have to be. We all are called to be scientists. But we're also called to be thinking scientists, philosophers, if you will. So the kind of thinking the man does as a knower for the sake of knowing differs from the thinking done to act morally, socially, politically, which in turn differs from the thinking done to make things. Each one of these three is productive of a certain end. Those ends are different, and the means by which to obtain them are different, and, those, and that has to be um, uh, quite, quite well internalized, actually. Now, in the sphere of knowing, we are, cons we are concerned with truth as truth. In the sphere of doing, we're concerned with truth as action, characterized as good, as good and evil, right or wrong. In the sphere of making things, we are concerned with truth as beauty. In other words, if I get into a very nicely designed and built car, what are the kind of terms we usually use? Oh, she purrs like a kitten. Oh, this baby is well built. Oh, this thing just runs how beautifully. And it's more than a metaphor here. It is much more than a metaphor that's going on. Okay. Now, so let's get to science. Now, science is not what Wikipedia tells you. Yeah. <laughs> science, is, science is much, much broader than that. Um, what, we, what Wikipedia tells you is burdened, and I use that word intentionally, is burdened by a certain narrow understanding of what we can know exactly with certitude, whatever. In other words, it's echoing a philosophy, that kind of view, that narrowing view, is already echoing a philosophy. Scientism, naturalism, philosophical naturalism, materialism, and so on. Okay. The writ large understanding of what science is, in fact, the top line is the definition of science. Immediate intellectual knowledge obtained through demonstration. Immediate because we need something to mediate from what we know to new knowledge. Whether you start with a simple syllogism or whether you work through the scientific method or whatever method or means by which you attain new knowledge, you don't just know it angelically, instantly. We are, we are creatures that live in a world, we are sensory-based creatures, we reason from our senses to those higher verities. Okay. Now, um, so I'll put that to the side and then go back to the questions of what does science do, and then I'll ask the question, what does science study? Well, I just gave away the answer to the first one, to the second one. What does science do? It studies things. Okay. It studies things. Now. Uh, something I forgot to say about the first question. Philosophy is fully, fully a science in its own right. That it doesn't use uh, microscopes or telescopes or certain hardware instrumentation, or that it doesn't use certain ways of reasoning to things does not disqualify it from being a science. It reasons to new knowledge. And once you have new knowledge, you know a truth. Once you are in possession of a truth, or I would rather say, once the truth is in possession of you, you have science. Philo uh, philosophy. Theology is also a fully, fully scientific endeavor. But it's not a scientific endeavor in the narrow sense of the word. It's a scientific endeavor in that, the, that you employ philosophy to reflect upon revealed knowledge that is scripture to reason to higher verities, to know more. I mean, in fact, we're enjoined by God to do that, right? Love the Lord your God with all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. With all your mind. Okay. And we're responsible for, uh, for that. I can't remember where it is. In 1 Peter 15, where we're responsible for our faith. We're responsible for transmitting it, for letting people know. Well, if you're going to be responsible for something, do it right. Okay. So, what do the sciences do? I, I talked about this before. 
the theoretical sciences, sometimes they're called the speculative sciences, study truth as truth. The applied sciences study truth in doing an action or truth in making slash beauty. And then you have the methodological sciences, which are largely logic. Now, that's a kind of vertical, um, vertical understanding because it's the differentiation is based on the outcome or result that's produced. Now I'm going to go horizontal. Because now that we know that science studies things and is the, uh, is the means by which we obtain knowledge of the real world, we have to go horizontal and know what it is that the sciences study. The theoretical sciences traditionally, and I say this in a broad way, okay, don't crucify me because I'm not going to get down to each and every individual science. Studies, there are three primary broad speculative sciences. The philosophy of nature, under which you have the, the natural empirical sciences. You have mathematics, and you have metaphysics. Okay. Under the applied sciences, you have ethics. Science, uh, ethics is a science. Moral philosophy is a science, but again, not in the natural science sense. Okay. It's productive of truth. The arts, the, the, the making. The f we make fine art. We, we do medicine, we, uh, we do engineering, okay? And that's why engineering can't be conflated with, metaphys with metaphysics. Even if you only look simply at this taxonomy, the what it does and what it studies, you can't, those two can't be conflated. Now, what I need to do next, before I get back to engineering, is to focus on the three metaphysics, mathematics, and philosophy of nature. Those three areas, those three sciences writ large, are distinguished, as I said before, by their subject matter. What is it that they study? But even more importantly, from the philosophical perspective, is to what level of abstraction are we taken in each one of these three? And there is a very distinct uh, and important difference. So. What the level of abstraction does is it yields the proper object or the subject matter of each discipline. The first level of abstraction is the least amount. Right? It leaves behind particular matter, meaning physics doesn't study that particular ball falling, although it does gather data. It studies what? Falling objects, not particulars. How do objects universally move? We, uh, in other words, if you're going to uh, draw the difference between a substance and an accident, it doesn't study the redness of this particular apple. It studies what redness is. It doesn't study, well, not physics, now we're going, getting all, away from physics, but it doesn't study Socrates per se. It, so, it studies human beings. The natural sciences study human beings, the broader perspective. That's the first level of, uh, of abstraction. In other words, the beings upon which the natural sciences focus are those that are resolved in the senses. We sense things. You've got to open your eyes. Psalm 19.1, the heavens uh, proclaim the glory of God. Well, are they singing out there? Of course they're not singing. Okay. But you better believe they're proclaiming the glory of God. But there's one important distinction on how that's being done, and I need to get to the rest. Okay. So, the subject matter, at the end of the day, of the natural sciences, uh, I, I should say, of the philosophy of nature that you, that you um, differentiate, is changeable being. It can't be stated enough that the natural sciences need to presuppose change in any of its manifestations. It doesn't matter if you're studying a ball starting at time t equals 1 here, at this position, time t equals 2, uh, another, uh, it's at another position. It doesn't matter if you're talking about the growth of things. It doesn't matter if you're talking about um, an apple ripening from green to red. All those things, anything that changes in our real experimental world is accessible to the <coughs> empirical sciences, and it should be. Okay. The second level of abstraction is mathematics. Now, mathematics, and partly Professor Bradley uh, showed us some excellent examples of this. Mathematics is, is, is a very interesting field because it's reflective of some deep unity and orderliness of nature. Okay. 
The second level of abstraction, the higher level of abstraction, is where all sensible aspects of what you study are left behind except for one, quantity. Whether that quantity, okay, so mathematics is the study of things that can be imagined and conceived without matter, not just individuating or particular matter. Right? For example, a triangle. Geometry isn't concerned about whether a triangle is made of wood or stone or metal. What geometry studies is not the matter there. It studies the fact, for example, if, you're gonna, if we're talking about Euclid, that the sum of the three angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Moreover, mathematics is unchanging in its character. There is no empirical evidence whatsoever that you could ever obtain to cast down or to eliminate that knowledge. In Euclidean geometry, everywhere, at every time, it's atemporal uh, knowledge. Those triangles, uh, those angles in the triangle add up to 180 degrees. If you want to change to Riemann uh, geometry, that's fine. But it also will have an orderly way of dealing with triangles. Okay. So the focus is on the, what's called the first accident of real being, quantity. Okay. Discrete meaning things exist separately and can be counted. Continuous, right? one-dimensional lines, two-dimensional surfaces, three-dimensional lines, n-dimensional manifolds. Okay? That's another aspect that could be studied. And then, perhaps the most distant in terms of abstraction even within mathematics itself is the relational aspect. Relational meaning equations and inequalities. There you really have to start thinking conceptually, not so much uh, in the images. The third level of abstraction is the one that leaves all material aspects behind. And technically, it's not even called abstraction. It's called separation precisely because it's separated. Right? It separates out that which can exist without matter. Okay? Examples. When you're talking about unity, substance, soul, potency, causality, and so on, these are concepts that apply to all beings. All contingent beings apply. These apply. That's the job of metaphysics. It resolves those things in the mind, conceptually. There are no images. You have no image of, of, of a cause. Okay. Um, and let me give you an example, uh, if I can. shoeness or dogginess. If you remove all the individuating characteristics from dogs, whether they're shaggy or not, tall or small, tall or short, fat, whether they live here or there and at what time, you finally come upon something called dogginess, the nature, something that's shared among dogs that each and every one of you knows that's a dog, it's not the Andromeda galaxy, and it's not uh, uh, a killer whale. Okay. Um, that notion is an extremely important one, because at that point you're talking about the, uh, the essence of the substance. What is a substance? I'm not talking in terms of chemistry, I'm talking in terms of metaphysics. <clears throat> it's no mistake that the word substance means the, the thing that stands under or below the accidents which are, which are um, accessible to the senses. And the other interesting thing about the word substance, substance is what you understand. You understand not the, you're not focused on the whiteness, you're focused on the thing that is white. That's the realm of metaphysics. It, it, again, to repeat, those aspects are the ones that are shared by all contingent beings. What is shoeness, what is dogginess, and what is change? The thing that's presupposed by all the natural sciences, change. Metaphysics doesn't ask, how does that apple change from green to red? It asks, what is change? You see what I'm saying? There's a very, there's a very different question uh, that's being asked, and it's productive of, uh, of some important stuff. Now, what this does, of course, for meta metaphysics, is that it becomes the foundational discipline. It is the foundational science. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a gentleman by the name of Anthony Rizzi who actually wrote a book entitled The Science Before Science, in the sense of pro, pro, uh, uh, not temporary. Okay. The Science Before Science. 
Why? Because no particular science can prove its own first principles. If it tried to do that, it would be circular. In fact, it would be viciously circular. It has to have something above it to say, hey, this is change. Now, I'm going to give some examples when I go to uh, motion. In fact, let me go to that a little bit more quickly. What is motion? <clears throat> I do this with my survey of science uh, students, and they're actually quite surprised uh, at the answer. In a group of about 100 people, random people chosen from all over the United States, if you ask how many of you are seismologists, you know, how many of you <coughs> do this stuff like model tectonic <coughs> subduction zones, okay? you may get one person, two, two if you're uh, on a good day. The next question to ask the audience is, how many of you have experienced an earthquake? So out of those 100 people, how many people have experienced an earthquake here? All of you. It's so yeah. Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> I think the average would be about 7 to 12. <laughs> okay, so, but, but the point is, more have experienced an earthquake than do actual seismology. But then I ask the students, how many of you have experienced motion? They look at each other quizzically. What's he talking about? We all know what motion is. We all have experienced motion. What I've just gone through is to show how those sciences are distinguished. Right? The sciences study reality in a very narrow way. They have to be free to do that. They have to be able to dive deeply, unimpaired, into reality to try to unlock her secrets. Okay. The philosophy of nature and metaphysics don't have it that easy. They can't deal just with this guy talking about subduction zones. They can't talk about Newtonian bodies falling. They can't talk about um, uh, quantum entanglement. They have to talk about change writ large. So what is change for physics? Or what is motion for physics? A change in position of a material object with respect to time with, with the subsequent equations. Well, what is motion for, for a metaphysician? Motion is a species of change. It's termed local physical motion, and we all know that the three forms of that are uh, translational, vibrational, and rotational, or orbit. Okay. Change for the metaphysician is the reduction of, an, this is the formal definition, the reduction of an object from potency to act insofar as the object is in potency. Now, what do I mean by that? This is precisely what the natural sciences um, need to have in place. The natural sciences need to know what change is so that they can be let loose to do their good work. By the way, when Newton said, you guys probably all, all uh, at some point have encountered this, when Newton said, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the, on the uh, shoulders of giants, <coughs> he was not talking about scientists in the way that we understand it. He was talking about the philosophers of nature who opened the door for science, right? The, the scientific revolution didn't pop out, of the, uh, pop out of thin air. You had to have a mindset, a healthy mindset, a, if you will, in fact, it's not just if you will, it is a biblical mindset, one that, that enhances, one that encourages study. If the, if, if the scriptures say the heavens pro, uh, proclaim the glory of God and many other scriptures, well, you're kind of going to be at a psychological uh, level interested in studying the real world. Because through the knowledge of the real world, you, you gain as much of that knowledge as you can, so that you can then ultimately reason to that higher verity, verities to God, ultimately. Okay. Motion. It is not a metaphor for me to say, I was moved by the beauty of my wife. I was not in love. I was moved and fell in love. If I want to play reductionist scientist here, I was in state one at time t equals one. I was in state two at time equals uh, at time t equals two. Right? It's a reduction from potentially being there to actually being there, and it frees the scientists to do their work. Now, engineering. Let's talk about engineering. The goal of the speculative or the pure sciences, uh, to repeat, is to conform one's mind to reality. If one's mind is not conformed to reality and one says something, one is not speaking the truth. Pure and simple. If I say the neutron star at the center of the, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, in Taurus, is wearing blue jeans today, right? you have to go check. But it's not. You find out that it's not. Thank <laughs> you.
so if, if I see that a, that, that, that a neutron star in, in the uh, uh, constellation of Taurus is wearing blue jeans, my mind is not conformed to reality. I've just spoken falsely. But if we go to, to Aristotle, the very first line of the very first book, the opening line of Aristotle's Metaphysics, by nature, all men want to know. That's his first line. We are rational animals. He understood that. We want to know the truth. We're not interested in the falsehood. In fact, if you, if you study the Greek, it's an, inter it's an interesting word. It's not the word desire that's actually the correct translation of that. It's covet, or something closer to the word covet. We as humans, by our nature, want to know. We covet knowledge in, in, in that good sense. It's no accident that in, that in scripture, uh, the, the euphemism, if you will, is used for a man to know his wife. That's a very important and deep statement. And what is the beatific vision that hopefully awaits us? To know God for eternity. That knowledge thing is so central to us as human beings. Okay. So the, the goal of the applied sciences is to conform one's actions to reality. Which actions conform to reality? What ought we to do? And how we should act? But here's where it gets a bit, a bit interesting. One can only be successful in the applied sciences to the extent that one is successful in the theoretical or speculative sciences. That's precisely why engineers study science 24-7. You've got to know how the real world works before you start building something. If you don't know how the real world works, please don't build anything. <laughs> <laughs> Ethics answers the questions, what should we do and why? But here's a really interesting thing. The arts are subordinate to ethics. You have to first decide what, what one ought to do, which employs, uh, implies, of course, knowing why. Then and only then should you properly enter into the details of how to do it. Right? Just because we have technologies that can efficiently abort, it doesn't mean we can do them. Metaphysics is ultimately connected to engineering. <coughs> why? Because it studies the first causes the principles of all beings, including those things that are studied by the, by the modern empirical sciences and engineering. Okay. But the modern empirical sciences, meaning the theoretical or speculative sciences, are closer to metaphysics because A, they're speculative in a similar way to metaphysics. Mm -hmm. B, they provide input to meta metaphysics, real world sensory based knowledge, science if you will, for philosophy to reflect upon. And then metaphysics through natural philosophy provides the modern empirical sciences with foundational principles. The example of motion that I gave and many, many more. But when you move to engineering, and remember this is an engineer speaking to you, okay, um, while engineering is further from metaphysics because A, it's an applied knowledge, it's productive of artifacts rather than speculative knowledge. It depends on the modern empirical sciences to provide knowledge of the real world. It provides metaphysics only with qualified knowledge. <coughs> qualified how? It always has to go back to the sciences, and then the sciences speak. And I, uh, of course, I'm speaking metaphorically. Okay. Metaphysics through, to repeat, metaphysics through the natural, uh, through natural philosophy and the, the modern empirical sciences provides engineering with foundational <coughs> principles. One thing I wanted to clarify, when I say natural philosophy or the philosophy of nature, I am not speaking of philosophical naturalism. I am not. This is, this is a whole field in and of itself. And I'm also not speaking about the philosophy of science. The object of the philosophy of science, the thing that the philosophy of science studies is technically it's termed uh, epistemic method, methodology. That's a fancy word for the scientific method. It asks how we know things. The philosophy of nature asks, what is that? What is change? So they're two very distinct fields. Okay. Now, I've taken that previous slide and just, uh, just emphasized uh, in a couple of ways. Scientific knowledge can be, should be, productive, uh, productively applied through technology. And what is technology? Scientific know-how. Okay. Through technology, and it gives us the skill and power to produce things. <coughs> very important things. We wouldn't be living as long as we do today if we didn't have biotechnologies, if we didn't have all sorts of wonderful technologies. 
These are very important to us. Okay? But philosophical reflection or understanding improves our common sense grasp of the physical world in the broadest sense possible. But it doesn't give us either the skill or the power to produce anything. Philosophy bakes no cakes and it builds no bridges. So, does that mean philosophy is useless in the Marxist sense? Of course not. Philosophical knowledge lays the foundations that can't be stressed enough. Philosophical knowledge is extremely important in that sense. It puts us in touch with reality from the most broad and common understanding to reflect upon it. And if we need the tools of science to, to enhance that reflection, all the better. Okay. Now, this is where I'm going to get provocative even more than I have been so far, perhaps. There's also an analogous understanding or connection of metaphysics to, uh, to engineering. Metaphysics draws analogies from the way things, in this case I'm referring to things as artifacts, meaning made by us. Metaphysics draws analogies from the way things are made and function to make inferences about those things, meaning concepts, those higher verities that we're trying to get to, that cannot change. The simple one that I gave you is no empirical evidence will ever crash and burn the Euclidean understanding of what a triangle is. Okay. Um, metaphysics compares change in artifacts to change in natural things and then states for us what change is. And probably the most important line, that, sorry, I didn't get that. The most important line here is one from Aristotle. Art or artifacts imitate nature. Art or artifacts imitate nature. It's not the other way around. In fact, you get yourself in deep trouble if you say, as, and this is where I'm going to criti criticize uh, Mike, uh, Michael B. In fact, let me get to that. A mistake is made to neglect these analogies, to flip it on its head, to fall into the fallacy that's most common, one of the most common today, that nature imitates artifacts. What do I mean by that? The irony in all this is that the mechanistic reductionist error ironically share, is shared by intelligent design and Darwinists. Michael B. to quote, modern science reveals the cell is a sophisticated automated nanoscale factory. It does nothing of the kind. Science doesn't say that at all. Science doesn't deal with these higher level verities. Science doesn't tell you that. Philosophy may tell you that, but you better do correct philosophizing. Okay? And notice the strength of the term that he's using. He's not using it as a metaphor. I was with him in December. I know he doesn't use this as a metaphor. Note it compared to what uh, one of the arch Darwinists says. The entire cell can be viewed as a factory that contains an elaborate network of interlocking assembly lines. At least this guy is saying can be viewed as. He's not saying is. You understand what I'm saying? To flip reality on its head and say that the cell resembles a factory is, is at an ontological uh, level, nonsense. It's utter nonsense because it's much, much more than that. It's like saying a house is just a collection of bricks and mortar and wood and nails and plastic and, and glass and whatever. Okay. Intelligent design is neither, at this point, a science nor engineering. Physicists, and, and one of the stark ways that you can show this, you guys are probably familiar with the discovery of the neutrino, or how the existence of the neutrino was inferred. It had to do with um, certain anomalies that they saw in particular um, apparent violations in uh, the conservation of angular momentum, spin angular momentum, and energy. Something was going on. They did, the scientists did the good work. They inferred the existence of a neutrino. They did more good work. Bang. They found it. What did they find? Well, they found a neutrino. What does intelligent design purport to do? To infer the existence of what? Design. Let me go back all the way to the beginning of my, of my talk. You've got to be out of your mind to deny the existence of design in the universe, literally. But you've got to be careful and rigorous in how you demonstrate the existence of design. And it's not a joke. Okay. 
is you have to ask yourself the question, is design, inferring to design, this thing called design, whatever it is, is it the same kind of thing as a neutrino? In fact, is design the same kind of thing that any science, I don't care if you're talking biology, chemistry, physics, or whatever, is it the kind of object that any of the modern empirical sciences seek? No. And I can say that in absolute terms, no. Because design is an abstraction. It's a combination, actually, of the formal cause and the final cause. It's an abstraction. And if you want to argue to the higher immaterial verity of design, you can't do it in the sciences. You use the sciences, of course. It'd be, it'd be nonsense to throw out the sciences. You take the data from science, and then you do proper philosophical reasoning. In fact, what Professor Bradley said in, in his talk was very important. Intelli how do you say that intelligent design is not opposed to science? It's opposed to materialism. Yes. Well, it's an alternative. It, exactly correct. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly the correct thing. But then the implication is the following. If, and I, and I agree fully, if intelligent design is the answer to materialism, then intelligent design is not a science in the sense of a natural science. It draws upon science to draw philosophical conclusions. It is a philosophy. Now, I'm personally, um, maybe this is going over, I'm personally saddened because of the lack of this distinction that the fight was fought on the wrong battleground, trying to introduce intelligent design into the biology classroom. The reason it's sad for me is not even that fight. The reason it's sad for me is that our high schools do a great disservice to our kids without even the smallest introduction to philosophical reasoning. That's where the battle is lost, in my opinion. The neutrino, on the other hand, is not like design because a neutrino isn't an abstraction. It's a real extra mental entity that has spin, that has mass, that has position, <coughs> velocity. We can actually sensory through instrument enhancement, of course, find it, see it, put it in a scale, smell it. Well, it doesn't have that problem. <laughs> All right. So, what am I leading to? Because we are by nature rational animals, we are capable of knowing God's eternal power and divinity from the things he has made, what Professor uh, Bradley shared with us. By the light of human reason alone. Why? Let's read that uh, uh, passage uh, more carefully. For what can be known about God is evident too, and he's talking about the wicked. You have to go uh, uh, a sentence about that. He's talking about the wicked. In other words, he's talking about the unbelievers. And yet notice what he's saying. Even the unbelievers can, can know God because God made it evident to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to, have been able to be understood and perceived in what he's made. What modern empirical science, what natural science deals with invisible things? None. Invisible means not accessible to the senses. The knowledge that's presupposed by St. Paul in this passage can't possibly be that of beautiful galactic nebula, bacterial flagella, cosmic fine-tuning, fine engineering system analysis of cell processes, and so on. St. Paul was not speaking about knowledge gained through the modern empirical sciences or through engineering. Rather, the knowledge that he was talking about must be grounded in, in pre-scientific, and this is also something Professor Bradley brought up, pre-scientific experience and philosophical reflection animated by presuppositions and intellectual habits whose origin is in Christianity. Professor Bradley made another point. Watson's biological view was constrained by his materialism. Spot on correct. I'd go further. A Christian's biological view is enhanced by his faith and solid realist philosophy. It's enhanced just like grace perfects nature. We know because we've been given the gift to know. And in union, in cooperation with God, the Logos, all our little Logi know things, and then through those things we know Him. Okay. Now, a word about creation. Like you can do that in two slides. <laughs> um, well, <coughs> 
Let me just flash through this because this is important. In the beginning was the Logos, the Word. Logos, logic, intellect, word, John 1.1. We're all familiar with that. A couple hundred years prior to that, we have in Psalm 32.6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were established. The word. There it is again, the word. And a few hundred years earlier to that was, with wisdom God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. That's an important point that I'm getting to. It's a mistranslation to say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It, it, it literally, if you read the Hebrew, is, uh, or the Aramaic, I'm sorry, um, is with wisdom, or in wisdom, he created. Point one. Point two, creation is not a change. Creation is not a change. Remember what change is. Change is the reduction from potency to act. There's a time one state, there's a time two state. If you have nothing at the beginning, you have nothing. It's not only that you don't have substances, you don't have time, you have no, none of the other accidents. In fact, it's erroneous to say God, uh, the, the Latin ex nihilo, people usually translate it as created from nothing. The preposition from is wrong. You have to be very careful with that preposition. It's not like nothing is something out of which you draw something. Nothing means literally nothing. Right? It's to use it to give you an analogy. If I ask my students, what's a shadow? Is a shadow a thing? A shadow is not a thing. A shadow is a privation of thingness. It's a privation of a certain being called light. We humans, to wrap our minds around shadows, say it's a thing, but it really is not a thing. But maybe perplexingly, it's also not nothing. Because if it was nothing, you wouldn't even be able to even begin to know that a shadow is there. It's not nothing, but it's not a thing in the sense that this paper is a thing. It's a privation of being. So change presupposes beginning state and an end state, and hence is accessible, and it should be to the modern empirical sciences. But that's precisely why the modern empirical sciences have no access to creation. Creation is a philosophical and, and uh, I should say, metaphysical and theological term that has to be understood in its own right and not be reduced to something that's accessible or needs to be validated by the, by the natural sciences. We have better sciences to do that. We have theology, we have philosophy, okay? And because, uh, okay, uh, and certainly not accessible to the modern empirical sciences and engineering, because there's no beginning when you're talking about nothing. God is outside of time, not because he creates time like, I'm gonna make time. He creates contingent beings that change. What is time? The metric of change. You can only have time if things change. And the final thing that, uh, of reducing creation to something accessible to the modern empirical sciences is it reduces God himself to something that's, that's an object among other objects, that's a being among other beings. God is, uh, um, you guys I'm sure, so I apologize for lecture, you guys I'm sure know that it's actually fundamentally and rigorously incorrect to say that God exists. Because that implies that God exists somehow, some way, like other existence. God doesn't exist. He's existence itself. His creation is an all-going, atemporal thing, if you will, that keeps everything, that maintains everything in existence. And to think that either people like Mladeno and Hawking, or someone who doesn't understand creation uh, uh, on our side would like to reduce creation to something that's accessible by the, the modern empirical sciences, I would be the first uh, to stand up and say, you've got to stop that kind of nonsense. You've got to stop that kind of nonsense. So, my conclusion. Don't change the boundaries. Don't change the boundaries. Don't change the, the, the boundaries of knowledge. Truth is a symphony with each instrument contributing 
and each instrument not encroaching upon the territory of the other. If a tuba tried to play the, the, the music of a piccolo, you'd have dissonance. You would have chaos, almost, in a sense. Yeah, it could try, but it'd be awfully non-beautiful. There must be an engineer who creates, say, Mr. Stradivarius, uh, builds, not creates, uh, a violin. There must be a conductor metaphysics, that which gives life to, to the very beauty that's produced by each one of those truths, each one of those instruments. And of course, we can never forget that there must be the composer himself, God. <clears throat> that's it. Yes. Uh, do you think it's possible to empirically and quantitatively distinguish between designed and not designed uh, entities? No, precisely because of what design is. Okay. Empir empirical means what? Well, using sense data. Exactly. In other words, sense data that can be, in fact, quantified, measured. Okay. There's nothing that's measurable about design. You look at the quantity, you look at information, and then you reason to the existence of design. But your, that reasoning process is not through the sciences. The sciences have already done their fantastic, wonderful, efficient work. They've gotten you, they've put on a silver platter for you some fantastic things. But is that enough to conclude just by itself that God exists, for example? Or that design exists? Design is a different kind of animal. It's a different being. It's a thing that has no touch, smell. It can't be heard, it can't be, it can't be tasted can't be seen. Just like, by the way, the scientific method. Where is the scientific method? And, and this happens, I mean, it's almost, it's almost laughable if it wasn't so sad. If you ask an atheist who's defending the scientific method as the way to knowledge, that, you know, if it's not, if we can't see it, it doesn't exist. Great. Put a scientific method on my table and let me measure it. Oh, well, that's, you know, but, um, oh, but, you know, it's things that we make in our brain. Well, then call it the thing that you make in your brain. Call it the complex, time-dependent uh, electrochemical signals traveling between synapses. Don't call it the scientific method. Don't jump. Don't make that jump without demonstrating that you can make that jump in the first place. And don't do philosophy if you're not equipped to do philosophy. Right, well, I can phrase my question another way. It sure. Go into that territory. So, say you had like a watch and a rock. Are there like specific things you can, if, uh, physical things about those two artifacts that would say one is created by a person and the other is created by uh, physical processes? Are you distinguishing characteristics of things that people have made, for instance, versus things that nature has made? And more generally, would there be distinguishing characteristics of uh, entities that? more general sense intelligence, intelligent beings have made versus things that are just deterministic or random entities have made. That, that's what intelligent design is ultimately about. It's, um, I, 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 mean, I think there are specific thresholds that point but, one way or the other. Yeah, let me first of all clarify again. I'm a big intelligent design proponent, but I want it done right. I don't want people embarrassed by those who don't, aren't in command of their philosophy. Which means I don't want our side, and I, and I apologize for putting it in those terms, I don't want our side to be as chowder-headed as Dawkins and Dennett and Stenger and, you know, all these other guys. Yes, you, again, I'll, I'll, I'll get up on top of your needle here on campus and I'll scream it at the top of my lungs. You've got to be a chowder-head if you can't see design in the universe. But you've got to make that argument rigorously. You've got to use the science. Okay, so that's, let me just put that to rest. The other thing is, stones are not artifacts. Stones, whatever term you want. But that's the important distinction that I actually tried to make here. Stones are not artifacts. Stones are natural things. Beetles are natural things. We are natural things. We produce natural things when we reproduce. Okay. But an artifact, by definition, is something that's made by a rational creature that would never have occurred if nature alone was supposed to do it. Why? Because it's not in the nature 
of the things to do that. You will never get, it's not, it's not just by chance, and this is where on one point where I disagree, it's not just by chance that you'll never get the Brooklyn Bridge appearing on nature. I can say it in an absolutist sense. Because, the, uh, because if you've got nature and there are no rational agents in nature, you cannot build a bridge by itself. You cannot, because it's an artifact. It's a thing that only happens uh, from rational agents. So in terms of that distinction, you've got to keep that distinction very, very close to heart. Because if you don't, what happens? You start, even with the best of intentions, you start reducing all things to artifacts. In fact, please forgive me, I'm not, I'm not criticizing you or trying to belittle you in any way, but you literally just played the reductionist card when you said a stone is an artifact. Okay. No, 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 no. Well, a cell is not an artifact. It's not. Right, but how do we know whether something is an artifact versus just uh, something mm -hmm. that's well, energy impulse? Though? When it's created, when it's... Uh, but if you don't know the history of it, like if I just saw the Brooklyn Bridge, I didn't know someone made it. Why would I automatically think that's made by that's not just made by the water and rocks yeah. and whatnot? I would defer to the very good point that Professor Bradley made. If you see it, it's real common sense. You're but you're not seeing it with science. If you see, the, for example, the the picture of the lady in the tree, give me a break. I mean, I'm not going to do anything scientifically for you to show you whether that is or is not a lady. What I am going to do is reason and say, listen, something's going on here. It had to have been produced by a rational agent. There is no other explanation. And again, I, I differ on that point. It could not, literally could not. I can give you an example where that might bring it out, but that would take uh, a bit too much time. So I don't know if I answered your question. Second person, I think, yes. I have a <coughs> question about your view of really an engineering to science. You basically, as far as I can understand, we're saying that science, is, I mean, the engineering is applied science that's dependent upon science. Absolutely. But that seems to be not historical. Engineering took a long time before science. If you think of the building of the Great Pyramid or the Roman ar aqueducts or even medieval cathedrals, people sure. knew how to do things before they had a clue of why. It's, it's absolutely correct in the sense that, for example, when the great pyramids of Cheops were being built, that those guys had no command of Newtonian mechanics. I'll grant you that <coughs> hands down. But that doesn't mean that they didn't have some pre-scientific, if you want to call it that, knowledge that when you put a stone on a stone, it's not going to tip this way, it may tip that way, it's not going to sink into the ground. They didn't have quantifiable stuff because they weren't at that level yet, but they had pre-scientific knowledge. They had to know the, the basic mechanisms of how objects operate, which is science, in order to do what? To use those mechanisms to build pyramids. You, you can't just do a pyramid if you don't know <coughs> how stones what, what the external force applied to this stone at this angle at this precise time, yada yada, will do. That is, that's at the level of science. The engineering is what you do with that science. Another example. Well, no, I have too much time. Uh, yeah. Um, what, where in your hierarchy would the concept of modularity lie? So like, what do you mean by modularity? Um, like, for example, when, 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 when you build things, you kind of componentize, put certain things together that <coughs> relate together, and you put other things together that relate together. And, and you kind of, especially in software engineering, we tend to, to build things in, in separate modules. I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely clear, you know, is that, is that is, is, would modularity fall as a metaphysical concept, as an artifactual concept? First, where in, second level abstraction. Yeah, where, where, in the, where in the level of, is, is the concept of modularity? What are you presupposing that exists when you can modularly construct something? Um, it's usually a unity of... Uh, of what? Of, usually it's an, of an idea. Um, sometimes it's a function, sometimes it's um, a, of a practicality, but... You, Usually there's a general... Right. Uh, there's a unity to it. That's a very good word. Let's step away from computer science just for a moment because it's a little bit more distant, and then you may see the bridge. 
Lego logs, uh, it's not that, Lego pieces. Okay. I build a man. He's a modular unit that fits into the modular unit of my house, which fits into the modular unit of the farm, and so on and so on. <coughs> Ships, bridges, Star Trek, whatever. I don't care. What's presupposed in building those modular units in the first place? An understanding of how they work applied to the construction of the making of that modular unit. Once you've got that modular unit in place, have a ball. Go for it. And to answer your question directly without thinking too much about it, I would say that's prob probably an engineering concept slash uh, philosophical concept. But I, I need to think about that a little bit more. It's a very good question. But what's presupposed, I really want to bring it, bring it down, what's presupposed in the artifact, and I really want to emphasize that word artifact, those little units, is the knowledge to build those units. What kind of knowledge is that? Applied knowledge. What is the knowledge that's applied? Scientific knowledge. Science tells you what it is so that you can properly build a Lego piece, not out of jello, but out of some, you know, whatever, acetate plastic or whatever it is. I would, well, except modularity tends to be more of a, um, you usually don't use science to, uh, as, well, especially in software. Presupposed. Um, you usually don't use, um, I mean, it, it's usually based on um, the, the, the unities that are present within computer science. Right. It's, it's kind of a weird spot because they're, they're semi-artifactual units. They, um, they are, are, are they, no, it's not that they're semi, they are artifacts. They are artifacts. Those units, I'm not saying that that modular doesn't work. I'm not disagreeing with you at the modular sense to build bigger and bigger things. What I'm saying is that underlying all that is first of all scientific knowledge, then the know-how applied to build a unit, and then the engineering, the software design knowledge which is applied knowledge again, to build bigger and better things. I'm, I'm much more concerned about the underlying thing, to make sure that you've got the, the concept of modularity and the thingness and the knowledge to build it, first of all. And then, I mean, you know, you, by the way, you don't have to just apply it to software engineering or to module kind of things like Lego logs. Pretty much this building is like that, right? This building is a modular collection I'm sorry, a collection of modular things. Those lights were prefabbed. Right. Right. How did you know how to build the light? Well, you had to first understand how nature works. Mm -hmm. You build the light. Fantastic. You build the building. Wow. That's even more beautiful. But the, the modularness, I, I think you kind of just jumped over the modularness because it's the, the you, you had the science for the light, and then there was the, the thing. And, but there, there was the idea to, to put it as a module, the idea that this should be a module. Right, but that's a know-how type of knowledge. That's not a fundamental knowledge. That's a know-how type of knowledge. Okay. It's, what's the definition, uh, definition of technology? Scientific know-how. I'm not telling, uh, maybe this is where I'm being unclear. I'm not saying that physics will tell you how to build it. Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid. Mm -hmm. Physics isn't going to tell you how to build that. Physics tells you what you know, everything from the internals of the lights that are being used to what kind of materials can withstand what kind of external forces so they don't break, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. It takes the know-how of the people to then synthesize that knowledge to make something. Mm -hmm. The making is a different product at the end of the day than the knowing. To know something, you know it because it's important in and of itself. This thing isn't important in and of itself. It's important because it serves us. Um, I think, yeah, I'm sorry. I wanted to build on this question, and, it's, and I'm not a, a philosopher, so I may ramble for just a second. But sure. you, you built your hierarchy for the hierarchy that exists in metaphysics and science and religion. And the question was brought up about you know, Egypt piling up stones for uh, building a pyramid. Mm -hmm. Is there an experiential? Quality to engineering that well, well does the experiential quality of engineering does that is that 
can that be, here's my rambling word, somewhat metaphysical? I mean, just the fact that you know that you can pile rocks up? The short answer is no, because you're talking about particulars. Metaphysics talks about broadly across all kinds of being. Okay. Across all kinds of being. If you're talking about building a bridge, you're going to be very focused on those materials and on the know-how to build the bridge. Absolutely. Metaphysics, that's not a metaphysical thing. Metaphysics is going to know when, when you change from a non-bridge to a bridge, it's going to ask you, what's changed? If, if, if a neutrino starts here at point one and ends up here at point two, the metaphysics isn't going to ask you, how did it change position? It's going to ask you, what is change? What is motion? I work with engineers a lot, man. I right. spend an awful lot of time talking about uh, philosophy of design, uh, their experience, and, and all of these things. And, I, and I've opened, in part it's because, again, I'm not a philosopher. And the, uh, this is my first introduction to that concept. Sure. And I always considered it to be uh, somewhat metaphysical. And I guess that's just absolutely not the case. It's, it's what in a, it's, academic it's, rigorous. Yeah, in an academic rigorous thing, that's what that's why I'm I'm you'll find, I mean this is straying on the subject a little yeah. bit. I'm very much of a proponent of interdisciplinary um, uh, studies. In particular, and this brings me around full circle to why intelligent design I think is unbeatable if it's properly matched with good re re philosophical reflection. If you can get the science people together with good, solid, realist philosophers, you can't, I mean, you may be wrong. I don't think you can stop them. I don't think you can stop them. You can stop Hawking and Ladino and Dennett and Dawkins and Hawking and all those guys if you're philosophically equipped pretty much in three minutes. Because these guys really are chowderheads, not because they're dumb people, but because they say no. A priori, they say no. The only thing accessible to us is that which is accessible through the senses. Give me a break. I mean, really, give me a break. Yeah, go ahead. I just had a question on your artifacts and your definition of art. Were you including also fine arts like this? Yes. Like so <coughs> how, you said that science is essentially one, like uh, discovery of new truth. Um, yep. So how is the production of fine art the discovery of new truth? And also, how is art subordinate to ethics in all cases when often new art and the most successful art in most stages through the history of art is the art that goes flies in the face of ethics? Agreed. Let me give you an example from Shakespeare. How does Shakespeare prove to his readers that Juliet is beautiful? Is that how he proved it? Do you remember the line from Shakespeare? Again, what her to life the through sun sunset. What? I'm he sorry. Compares her to the sun. He compares her to the sunset. He compares and the moon and all this other stuff. That's at the level of what is called in logic poetic knowledge. It's poetic because it's so broad. You can't capture beauty in the sciences. Mm -hmm. In fact, the sciences presuppose beauty. I don't know if you, uh, to what extent you're familiar, but Paul Dirac, the Frenchman who discovered or, or who uh, inferred the existence of the positron, basically he was involved in matrix-based quantum mechanics. And he did what's called a reflection. Okay? Crudely put, he did a mathematical reflection. And he goes, wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Here you have the equations, that, the quantum mechanical equations that describe, they don't govern, they describe how, how an electron works. He manipulated the mathematics, reflected it in that complex sense, and said, wow, what's to stop the existence of this thing that might be called a positron? Lo and behold, they found a positron. That's amazing. That is such a display of human, the power of human reason as it's drawn to beauty. And we all, I mean, Professor Bradley's equations. If you've ever taken the time to solve Maxwell's equations, no, I, and I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm not. I'm really. I'm being actually very deadly serious. If you take the time to solve Maxwell's equations and see the speed of light drop out, if you don't get chills down your spine, I don't know what can put chills in your spine. 
I just, I don't know what. You've got to be kidding. These are four equations that describe all electromagnetic phenomena in the universe. Four equations fits in what? Two by two centimeter piece of paper. And all of electromagnetic reality is described by these four things? You've got to be kidding. That's, that's Einstein saying, this is mind blowing. The, the universe is understandable. Not only is it understandable, we can describe it. Not only can we describe it, we can learn more about it. And not only can we learn more about it, we ultimately reason to the ultimate cause. That's the beauty of that stuff. I mean, it really, as a physicist, I can tell you, I, it, it almost makes you want to cry. I mean, it really almost makes you want to cry when you see this stuff. Um, yeah, go ahead. So having a background in engineering and now uh, training in metaphysics and philosophy, how would you envision a fruitful interaction between those two fields, engineering and metaphysics? I would get the engineers, if I, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I would set up a school or at, find an institute at a school. I would try to get the best Christian uh, not just Christian, I think, I think uh, a lot of Jewish scholars would add quite a bit. Um, philosophers, engineers, and scientists together. And I would say, your job is to think. Your job is to think. Here's the money. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not statistically impaired. I know I'm not going to win the lottery. <laughs> but, <laughs> I wish I could do that. That's, that's kind of my plea to my students every time I talk to them. Every time I do a survey of physical science course. Every time I do, here's another example. Sorry, to, to, here's another example. What's the equation that describes the energy of, uh, of a moving body? One half mv squared. What's the equation that describes the energy content of, uh, of a spring mass system? One half kx squared. What's the e equation that describes the uh, energy contained in a capacitor, one half CV squared. What's the equation that describes the energy contained in an inductor? One half Li squared, and so on and so on and so on. Look at that. Absolutely the same beautiful, absolutely from the mathematical perspective, the same beautiful expression. Mathematically, there's no difference. But look at what it's describing. Electromagnetic phenomena, Newtonian mechanics. There has got to be something underlying that. I mean, but what a concept, beauty. And, and the final example is, of course, what Dostoevsky said. It's beauty that's going to save the world. Um, I feel like you didn't answer the second half. I'm sorry. I appreciate, the, you know, appreciate the first. That was good. Let me, let me qualify something. I can say in a single paragraph that which takes most mortals an entire sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the second half was how, how is it that. Um, are, that arts are subordinate to ethics oh. when most new and most the most successful yes. arts and the most appreciated arts are the ones that fly in the face of ethics. The, the problem with answering that is I can't answer it in a sound bite. What, what that has to do is understanding the reason why things exist. If things exist, intellectually speaking, you have to be honest to find out why they exist. There's four causes. You have to answer all four of those questions to have a full understanding of why things exist material cause, the formal cause, the final cause, and the efficient cause. Okay. What possible final cause could there be in someone, uh, let's not go to fine arts just for a second, let's go to someone just fiddling around, <coughs> a little kid tinkering with toys. Right. He's drawn to those toys because they're, for him they're beautiful. He's tinkering around and he comes up with this cool vehicle and he runs to his dad and his mom and he says, Mom, look what I made. Do you think that child was thinking about building that vehicle? No. Did he have some kind of goal in mind? No. Same thing with fine arts. Those guys are kind of painting around, hey, this is cool. What if I do it here? What if I mix these colors? What if I chip the stone this way? And he comes up, well, you know, that really is beautiful. Did he have a fine, did, did he have a goal in mind to make that final product? No. Does that mean that there's no final cause? Impossible. There must be a final cause. Otherwise, you couldn't explain the existence of that thing. The final cause was this kid or this artist is always drawn to what? Beauty. Beauty is that final cause. It's the thing that's drawing us ever, ever, all the time. And that beauty, the more we reflect on that beauty, 
in science, in engineering, through philosophy, through metaphysics, through theology, it's like all of a sudden you're, uh, and I had this experience when I was, when I was taking metaphysics formally. There, there came a point where I was like, I, I thought I was in a fog, and all of a sudden I bumped my nose on something. And I was like, holy cow. The ultimate explanation of everything is that most beautiful thing. That's why it's called the beatific vision. It's the O all the time, atemporal, basking in the warmth of the glow of beauty. So wouldn't you then say that it's actually ethics that's subject to beauty? No. no. Oh, well, wait a second, sorry. Beauty is a transcendental. And again, I can't answer that with a, with a, with a sound like truth. The true, the good, the beautiful, the one, <coughs> and others are what are called philosophically transcendental. So I mean, we're giving away off this subject here. But, um, I, I, I'd have to talk to you about it. So, and, and I really don't want to take the next question. Okay.